Uh, and I'll, I will take your hint and sort of not disappear, and then we can be there both to uh, talk to anybody who might want to say hello and ask for something. Also, I'd like to say thank you to you two at the end, just to oh, say. that's great. Uh, yeah, I think goes the, goes the other way. We're going to thank you. Absolutely. What you can't do is is applaud. I wish there was some kind of yeah, <laughs> like like you like you have you know applause tracks on TV. There should be an applause track on Zoom, don't you think? Okay. So just at the end, let everyone know that you're kind of someone has to say, oh, we're going to hang around and we're available if you want to chat. And yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Excited to do this. Um, Very can good. I start letting people in. That, yeah. I, if that's okay with Carla, that's great with me. Super. Very good. So, Carla, Wales, did you? We had snow yes. this morning in Riga. Snow? What? Snow, we had. It was freezing last night. It was snowing this morning. I don't mind for my own comfort, but I fear for the French wine crop. Um, <laughs> I think this happens about every 20 years, and they get, a, they get a frost just when the wines are all ripening. And uh, I see there's no red wine for the next year, which is a, a bit of a hardship. Um, now, I think eight o'clock has struck. And so I, I think we should probably begin. Is that okay with you? Okay, so it's Sunday, the 25th of April, browse a Zoom conversation, and we're very happy and honoured to welcome Carla Rappaport, the CEO and founder of Lumen Art Projects. And Lumen helps artists to make digital art. It helps to build audiences and awareness, and it helps galleries and institutions to display those artworks properly. So Carla, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Now you and I, we were friends from previous lives because we were journalists. We both worked on the Financial Times. Um, and then, you know, you discovered this new passion, this new field. It was a brilliant intuition, um, you know, in terms of the timing and the richness of the material. But what prompted you? What, what, what gave you the insight that this was the thing to do now? I was looking for the next thing after journalism. I had left the EIU and I had, for my sins, fallen in with a guy who had a place in Wales. And I needed something that was online, that played to the online world. I had been writing about tech for the Economist Intelligence Unit, as you know, after the FT, I'd been writing about uh, what had happened, what the internet had done to publishing and music. And some, something prompted me to have a look at what it was doing to art. And to my amazement, it, it, I found it wasn't doing anything to art. And uh, at the same time, I went to the amazing 2012 uh, David Hockney show at the Royal Academy in London, which some of your um, listeners may have gone, some of the people who've tuned in might have gone to the bigger picture. And there was all this work on iPads. And I was completely amazed. And I found myself describing it to other people because I was figuring out, I went back four times to the show. I was so amazed at the brilliance of the way the iPad showed the work and then the printouts up to the ceiling of the RA. And I wanted to find out if anyone else was doing this. And down a rabbit hole I went and found that thousands and thousands of people were doing it. Not only were they doing it, Robert, but they'd been doing it since the computer was invented. So this wasn't new, it was just neglected. And I don't know about you, but the idea of going somewhere that the rest of the world wasn't going really appealed to me. Um, it, it was a sort of untold story and there's nothing I like better from my journalism background to finding out about untold stories and got involved and thought of competition would help curate the best. And getting a good jury panel would bring in and an opening a call for entries for anyone in the world and anyone in the world could enter and anyone in the world did enter in that first year. Some of it was pretty crappy, but we had this amazing jury panel of incredible people who knew all about this genre. And through that, we found winners. 
And as you know, um, we used to take those winners on the road. And one of our first shows was, a, was thanks to you in Latvia, Robert Books, uh, where we put iPads in the bookshop. And I think back very fondly to those days when I had the idea I could go around the world with these works in my handbag on USB sticks. Well, <laughs> that's not really possible anymore. But um, it was, uh, it's been a great experience and really happy to talk about it with you today. And I remember like when we first talked and I was kind of baffled by the whole concept and I said, uh, but you know, it, if it's digital, you can copy it and nobody can tell the difference. And I, you know, little did I suspect at that point that somebody had already solved that one with the blockchain. But uh, you, know, you were the, you know, I think that you then pointed out to me exactly that in fact, digital art was well older than I am, which is pretty old. So let's go to our first image here because we're going to do the story of digital art in, in nine and a half pictures. So um, Ben Leposky. Oscillon 40, I had to look that up and it turns out to be the kind of pattern you get when you vibrate grains of sand on a tray, but that goes back to 1952. How did you find that? Where is it? What does it do? So how I found it, shall we move to the image, or er, er, can, can we go on to that image? Uh, next, there it is. So Robert asked me kindly to this conversation and he wanted to do the history of digital art. And the first thing I admitted to Robert was that the digital art world didn't start with Lumen. We were relative newcomers in 10 years still. And I decided to check out at the V&A, which is the keeper of the UK's digital art collection, uh, what they call the first piece of digital art. And here it is. Uh, it was created in 19... 52 using oscilloscopes. And Ben Leposky manipulated electronic waves that were then displayed on a fluorescent screen. The waves would have been constantly moving and undulating on that fluorescent screen. So there was no way of recording those, mo those movements on paper at the time, but by photographing them, he was able to capture these images and record them for history. So the world of digital art, the academic world, sees these, this image as arguably the very first piece of digital art. And as Robert says, it was a long time ago, 1952 is a long time ago. Uh, subsequently, the computer became popular in the 60s and artists flocked to using mainframe computers. And the real computer art that we know now, early name for digital art was computer art. Uh, started in the 60s, and the first gallery show was held in 1960, hmm, 1965, Howard Wise, in New York City. And then London played a big role by hosting something called the Cybernetic Serendipity in 1969, curated by Yasha Reinhardt, who's still alive, bless her. Um, and it all kind of rolled forward from that. Anyone who's interested in this history, I'm really happy to share links. There's a marvelous book on it. Uh, several books on it, but one book in particular I would recommend. But um, it, it's an extraordinary experience. And a lot of these early pioneers, Robert, are still alive. So I was very excited to be able to meet them and involve them in Lumen activities. And our connection to the Computer Arts Society here in the UK has been very helpful linking us up to these early pioneers, as I say, many of whom are still around. Mm, I, I remember cybernetic serendipity. I went because my elder brother was very keen on that. And I figured it's kind of like, you know, the first Velvet Underground album, you know, only a few thousand people bought it, but they all started bands. And in the case of cybernetic serendipity, everyone who went to that exhibition built a robot. I mean, it's something that's now <laughs> like a real timeline. Now, so let's jump forward and we're going to go to the first of, yeah, I should have said up front that you also had this amazing strategy for raising the profile of Lumen of positioning it first of all as a prize so in a sense you know the instead of you having to go to the digital world a lot of the digital world came to you and so here was the first of your all categories prize winners which and compared to what's coming later it's quite unchallenging isn't it it's <laughs> uh, it's it's kind of figurative it makes you think of that um 
Now that Disney film where some guy ties a lot of balloons to a chair, except here it's a head. Um, what do you remember about that prize giving and, and, and how this came out on top? Oh, it's really fun to look back on this. Um, we were in early supporter of the prize was Cardiff uh, Economic Council, Cardiff City Council gave us some money. I think they really didn't understand. They just thought digital sounds good. And I was able to blag my way into an office in, um, in Cardiff, bless them, for three years. And this, this um, prize giving was in Cardiff City Hall, which is a beautiful building. And what I remember about this piece is that it was the best of a not terribly inspiring bunch of work, but interesting bunch of work. And this piece is a photo montage or photo manipulation. And so Tommy Ingberg, this Swedish artist who won it, has won loads of prizes, but it's fair to say he remains in the photography world. And we parted company uh, after that first prize out of the photography world very quickly, and you'll see as we go on. But photography and digital art, we'll come back to that later on. Photography and digital art do have an overlap. And photography, as you know, was very badly treated in its early days. It was just copycat, it wasn't art. As printmaking was copycat, it wasn't art. So there's a lot of parallels to the way photography was treated. Uh, I think Tate Modern had its first photography show in 2006. So, you know, uh, there's a certain resonance there, but the work itself is um, sort of Magritte in style, maybe you could say to be really kind about it. But it gives no hint, as you say in your comments, um, as to what will become known as digital art. So, whereas, okay. there, and there's a big kind of jump in sophistication from there to the following year, isn't yeah. there? Where uh, you know suddenly you you kind of cut loose from the static figurative image. And uh, uh, now this is the second work which which sent me the dictionary and i apodomy is uh, <laughs> a, a greek based word for migration um, correct and wow, wow. this yeah, yeah and, and 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 this is a kind of surreal digitally generated video right so um uh, you know again what made this one stand out well first let's watch a little bit of it so uh let's watch very maybe 40 50 seconds Shall we stop there and then talk a little bit about it? Yeah, I, I love it. I mean, I could just watch that forever. Um, I feel that the way birds, too. Yeah? Very it's all about the birds. Very evocative. Now, nothing on that film that you saw was photography. It was all created with computer generated imagery. See what we know as CGI or a sort of animation style way of working. She's an animator, Katerina Anathopoulou, a Greek. 
and um, she was writing about um, apotomy was um, it was commissioned in Greece, and she was writing about the, the, for she was creating a work for a show that took place in Plato's Academy, where it's believed the philosopher uh, once taught. And so remember 2013 when she created this was in the heart of the economic crisis. And she's from Greece, she's from Athens, she lives in London. She wanted to show her feeling of the empty buildings that couldn't be completed, the sense of migration and Plato's idea of the human soul in a bird cage. So it, it, it's just such a winner in so many ways. And as you say, it, it moves you, you are transported by it. And I urge um, everyone who's come here tonight to click in and watch the whole film. Um, it is a beautiful piece. And I think this piece made our reputation as a prize to watch and made more artists want to come to Lumen and present their work. And it also caused us to realize we weren't about still image. We were about moving image as well as still image, which was a big jump at the beginning. And it's also striking to me how important the, the sound was in that. that uh, it's so beautiful. You know, the, you know, the visuals are great, but the sound, I think, uh, you know, moved me uh, quite distinctly. And also it's very striking that, you know, an ill-matched soundtrack could have completely ruined the enjoyment. So I, you know, I think that she would, yeah, that's genius on two fronts. And then we get to this next one, which makes me, if I knew how to pronounce the word gif, I would ask you whether this was a, a gif or a gif, but um, it's called, tell me about it. It's called yes, cellular so forms. This is a, yeah. a, a gif, a gif, a clip mm -hmm. of a piece that's generative. And now we're moving into pretty serious leap into art and tech. Andy Lomas, who created this work, is a Cambridge educated animator who was, when he entered the Lumen Prize, working part-time for Hollywood, Hollywood Studios, working on films like Avatar, making computer-generated graphics. But he got the idea that he could write his own software and create, if you can see from this, it's a very quick story, but he's basically evolving from basic cell to death in this GIF. And the work, which is three and a half minutes long, and I really, Again, beautiful music. Not my first thing that I want to have when I wake up, but it blew away the judges. And Andy is the most delightful man. And getting to know him and understanding the mathematician's view of art and the generative idea that, although this keeps going over and over in the same way, the actual piece never repeats itself. It generates. And, um, and I, I... go ahead. I was just going to say, I thought I caught a glimpse of the of the COVID virus making a, a, a guest <laughs> yeah, guest appearance absolutely. in the in, anyway. in which case it's it's way ahead of its time. It was way ahead. Okay. Now, it, it, man A looks kind of looks kind of meta in a way because the picture we've got here is of somebody actually is it they projecting the picture or no they... no no. So what's happening here is augmented reality. So do you know what I mean when I talk about AR? It means I think that you can see what's going on, but you're looking at some kind, looking at it through some kind of surface, a glass, which is adding features to it. Is that right? Yes, but there's more. So if you think about the picture that this man is looking at as a kind of beautiful QR code, he's scanning it with his iPad, and up on his iPad comes someone dancing, or it's a, it's a little bit unfortunate that you can't see the dance on his iPad. But the artist who is a dancer comes up and starts twirling. So it's an access, AR access, uh, gives you access to video that overlays the work in front of you. Um, it, it, it was stunning. We took this piece all around the world with exhibitions. We were still traveling very much with the winners at that stage in 2015. And I would just watch people stop in their tracks with their phones looking at this work and walking around it. And AR was very exciting. Um, it didn't really, I have to be fair, um, although it's amazing and beautiful, it didn't really catch on. I, I think it's fair to say the art world didn't wanna get on with AR art. Um, 
I don't know why. Maybe it gets back to this, you can't buy it, you can't sell it. It's, there's no scarcity factor with AR, but it sure is dazzling. And in terms of museum and, um, and festivals and commissions, AR has been very, very popular uh, in our work. And presumably when you were taking that around the world, you were having to essentially do quite a lot of work with the museums and the places of exhibition, kind of explaining to them you know, how to make it accessible and enjoyable to people. Um, yeah, I mean, basically we went where we, we, in 2015, we stopped buying consignment spaces and putting on our own shows and we started going where we were invited. So when we were invited, it was normally by institutions that wanted this kind of thing. And that changed in 2015, 2016. That was when we were getting our first invitations. Come do this for us, we'll pay you. They'll pay us, what? <laughs> so that was a very exciting change to the Lumen Prize. Um, so they, yeah. they, they would pay you, but you had already made a commitment at that point to be a non-profit, I guess. So, uh, well, but we use the money in order to pay wages. Non-profits have to mm -hmm. pay salary, Robert. Yeah, and non-profits have to grow and non-profits have to span the world because, uh, you know, the bigger and the better resource you get, the better it is for the artist too. Exactly. Thank you. But I mean, when we get to Mr. Beeple, then uh, I think <laughs> money is going to become a much bigger factor. Now, that was augmented reality. You know, I'm guessing from the looks of the next one that we're into virtual reality, are we, with these headsets? Correct. Absolutely correct. So this work, that handsome guy, too bad you can't see, next to the purple coat on the left is a guy looking. That's the artist, Fabio Giampetro, who is an incredibly handsome fellow. Um, uh, and he's an Italian painter nothing to do with digital art, but he got the idea that he wanted to find a technology for people to go into his picture. Not a world, not a video game, not a play area, but the picture. So he found a partner in Japan, not Japanese, and I think it's another Italian living in Japan who knew about VR. And what he built was an experience, you put the headset on and you look down and the picture went on to infinity below your feet. It was the most, it is the most extraordinary experience. And this was when VR hit our world in a big, big way. And it was very exciting um, to watch how VR again transformed the world um, of digital art. It is again an experience, more like the theater, I suppose, than going to a gallery. You have to wait in line to put, and of course now with the pandemic, it's a very hard problem to pass around headsets. But there are galleries, there's a gallery in London. I put it in my resources I'll share with uh, the audience. Gazelli Art House that has a VR library. And you can go and see past Lumen Prize uh, winners of this award, uh, as well as other works at, um, in their library. So galleries are starting to think of this and collectors are starting to think about buying them. I remember this period, it's now five years ago when you know, there was a lot of sort of hype and optimism about VR. And there was a famous picture of Mark Zuckerberg going through the catwalk of an auditorium surrounded by hundreds of people, all of them wearing VR headsets. And um, in, you know, in the rest, in, in everyday life, I think that's peaked. I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I, I have no sense of anybody, you know, watching VR or recommending VR. Unless and I you're don't a, a gamer. Gamers seem to yeah. love it. But, um, but how, no, I mean, well, no, I agree with And you. how's that been in the mix for the, like, the, the people contending for your prize? I mean, obviously in 2016, you had this great offering, um, which really seemed to be sort of you know, capturing the moment. Are people still putting in outstanding VR works or has that fallen out of fashion with artists well, too? the next year we changed the category to XR which was extended reality because we were getting works that were like film and VR and experiences like on the, again, using performance, dance. If you look at this year's winner of the XR prize, it's a, a person dancing with motion capture on her body. It's very elaborate. So yes, it's completely from the art world's perspective, completely um, evolved beyond VR and this year we won't even have an XR category. We're calling it this year for the 2021 award. Any artists out there, I hope you will enter. This is my little commercial. Um, we're calling it the Immersive Environments Award. So we don't even have a VR, XR, AR category, which reflects pretty much what you picked up that people aren't that excited about it from the art world point of view. 
I, I will go back though to Gazelle Art House, Mila, who's the curator there, I think the world of her. And I, when I went and visited her library, I thought it was stunning. Personally, I get a little bit agoraphobic inside those headsets, but I've seen 10 year olds spend 20 minutes in them. So, you know, maybe it's a generational thing and maybe Mila is really onto something, I hope so, from her, for her sake. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. I hate the feeling of being sort of you know, cut off from whatever's going on around me. But equally, you know, I've, uh, I've been in uh, you know, like a VR exploration game studio with my son. And uh, it's kind of amazing, you know, when, uh, when you think you're going on a boat down the Amazon or you know, looking out at a starry night. Um, so the next, so let, let's go on now to the plastic reflectic which I, I'm going to guess that's a coinage. That's not a word I've come across. And it looks like a kind of magic pinball table. You wave <laughs> your hand and all kinds of things happen. It does look like a magic happen. pinball. Um, when you see it, it doesn't evoke pinball at all. I think it's just the, the shot from top down. So Dias Beerstecker, Beerstecker is a Dutch artist. And 2017, as you'll remember, was the year that Trump became president. The environment was crumbling around us. And everything seemed um, politically and environmentally um, hopeless, plastic in the oceans and so on. And I wasn't surprised that that was the first year that we got a politically engaged piece winning. Um, Dice's piece in includes 600 plastic pieces taken from the ocean. And it has, um, it, it has engines below the water that pick up your um, so they're little motors that pick up your movement. So what that person is doing is waving and that moves, picks up your shape. So if you watch the GIF towards the end, you'll see the viewer's shape. And so it's very clever use of motion capture imagery um, with the audience. And it was our first interactive piece. So you walked up to it and you made things happen with your body. And this was very exciting in our world that we had a 3D interactive piece win the prize and we could, we could actually install it and uh, people wanted to show it and that it reflected this incredible thing that's happening to our environment, the pollution. Uh, so it was very exciting. And we've been working with Dice ever since on other projects. He went with us to China on a project where he built a tree that the water in the tree was tracked by his um, incredible cleverness and then projected onto a screen in Chengdu, China to show uh, uh, what the tree needed from people and you could stroke it and the tree would respond. It was very beautiful. Mm. What, does he kind of make his own hardware or is it, does he have the concept well, and then this, somebody else? Uh, such a good question. This was the first year that we, we ran into the studio. And you know, for, for Tommy Ingberg, that was him and a camera, right? with that bubbled head and then, then Photoshop, Adobe Photoshop, that's what he did to win his piece. With Dice, he had a, a grant from the Dutch government funding, a lot of these pieces get government funding if they're from uh, European countries. And he had a team of people and we were dealing with his people. I mean, I've met, we've met Dice many times. He's a lovely, lovely guy and we communicate directly with him, but basically we're dealing with Sophie, his team, you know. And it's just like the big studios of yore. I mean, Van Dyke didn't do all those pictures. He had a Van Dyke studio. I hate to compare, I, Dice, I'm comparing you to Van Dyke. I hope you're listening. But um, it, it, it is kind of that it complex. I, I put in my notes here, Robert, um, a few uh, summaries of the kinds of technology these artists were using. And it got so complicated that I wasn't sure I was going to be able to pronounce it. So I'm awfully glad you haven't asked me. <laughs> no, I, I was just thinking there are so many different, very advanced skills in a work like that, like conceiving it, but then executing it and you know, making the stuff, doing, you know, there's, there's gonna be a lot of code to be written there. You know, do you buy your sensors? Do you build your sensors? Yeah, I don't know, it's, uh, a, yeah, it's a project, it, right? It's a project and a lot of it is done in-house. They don't buy in stuff because they're inventing it, they're making it up. So these are very sophisticated uh, uh, people with tech. A lot of them have degrees both in art and tech. Some of them have computer degree, computer science degrees. Some of them just have tech degrees. Some of them in other, a lot of 
a lot of collaborations and collectives apply to the Lumen Prize. I'm happy to say that last year, a single artist won, though we'll get to her piece later. So single artists can still win. You don't have to have a collective to win, but um, a lot of collectives apply and a lot of collaborations. And often it's one person is the dancer and the artist and the other is the expert in the electronics. And, and the prize is correctly the prize for art and technology. Yeah? So the balance is kind of up to up to the artist and the technologist. And then something amazing happened in 2018, which well, is that Lucian, <laughs> that Lucian Freud won the prize, yeah? <laughs> or am, am, I, am I misreading that? <laughs> Very and good. That, uh, when I mentioned to Mario, I saw that connection uh, when I first met Mario Klingerman, who won with this, this um, artificial yeah. intelligence generated piece, that it looked like Lucian Freud's work. And he bristled, he was so upset, but I noticed recently he's embraced it as an, an antecedent you know, that he was influenced, which is of course all about art. All art reflects other art. And um, it's a great honor to be able to say what your influences are and what you brought to the practice. I mean, that's basically a lot of what contextual curatorial comments are about. What are we harking back to? But I do in this case want to read to your audience if they will bear with me how this work was made because this brought AI into Lumen. And it, it's interesting to understand how he did the process of finding this work because he will say this work was made by a machine. And it was the first machine made piece that won um, any big art prize. So you will decide for yourself after I read this little bit of text whether he curated it and found the piece. I think he was the originator of it or if the machines made it. So a neural network's interpretation of the human form. This image has been generated entirely by a machine using a chain of generative adversarial neural networks or GANs. In this chain is a randomly generated stick figure and it's used as an input to the first GAN which produces a painterly look in low res proto image in several steps. The low reg image is enhanced and upscaled to another GAN, increasing the resolution and adding details and textures. I control this process indirectly by training the model on selected data sets, the model's parameters, and eventually by making a curatorial choice. That's where Lucian Freud comes in, right? He's like, aha. This one really harks back to some other artists, contemporary artists uh, that I love. And he picks among thousands of the of variations produced by models, the one that speaks to him most. And um, so that's his process. He, what he doesn't say is a little coy, but the images he picks up to feed into his machines are um, both porn and um, sports images because they're naked or not clothed. They don't have a lot on their bodies. So it's an amazing process. He's been at this for 20 years. He's the real deal. He didn't just come to it and figure out some piece of software he bought off the shelf. He, figured this out himself and used um, amazing algorithms. Uh, he's, a, he's a true hero of mine. And if anyone can see um, into my, where I'm sitting behind me here is my print of Mario's work. Cause I collect, I was lucky enough to be able to collect one of his limited editions of this work. And another yeah. one of this edition is in the VNA collection that we opened up with. So the VNA bought it as well, which is very exciting. I have to say that's one of my favourites, um, and you know I think the you know, the the echoes of of Lucian Freud help me to enjoy it more, and certainly kind of make it more accessible to me. And um, and whereas Freud famously painted from life, I mean, what uh, you know, that description of the creative process, sort of taking images and in a sense sort of pitting them against one another is very much the way that Francis Bacon worked. I mean, his studio was you know, full of bizarre photographic anthologies drawn particularly from medicine and surgery and also from sports and newspapers. And, you know, in a way he was doing kind of the same thing, you know, throwing different images together, seeing you know, where, where the inspiration lay and then working up from there to, uh, you know, to the, to the, the, I should say the painterly version, but I'm, I'm now asking myself if I feel differently about this picture, you know, if I know it's painted by an AI or if it's painted by a person, I don't think I do. I mean, I think I like it uh, equally much in, in, you know, in either respect. 
Um, but it certainly feels perversely the most traditional of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the works here. Now, let me not linger too much on that much as I love it, and let's instead look on to melting memories, which um, also what we've got here is a, is a little bit of video. So if, we, if we've got a, a minute of that or so. That is breathtaking. So, I mean, yeah, go ahead. I was saying quite literally breathtaking. I mean, I, 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 unless I muted my microphone, you would have heard a sharp intake of breath, roughly where, um, you know, the, the swirl turned into a sea monster. <laughs> it, it's an extraordinary piece. Um, knocked out of the, knocked everyone out of the park. It looks 3D, but it's not 3D. It's actually 2D. And it has a special 50, uh, an amazing LED screen that it uses. Uh, and I know how much it costs to rent that LED screen because we had a customer who wanted it and actually showed it during lockdown in their museum in Norway because they were open. Norway last year was open. So we've had the pleasure of showing it. Um, this artist, Rafik Anadol, is an incredible guy. Again, a studio. So loads of people worked on that piece. Um, melting memories is um, uh, resonates because the data that feeds into the piece was captured from brainwaves. So pretty deep stuff. Um, I've written down, like I did for Mario, I've written down what the technical description is. Uh, it <laughs> it's, goes on for about three paragraphs, but at one point it mentions Higuchi's fractile dimension algorithm. And I went, ah, I'm not looking that up. I, I think my attitude is I just enjoy it um, and let the technical people enjoy the descriptions if that's what they want to do to understand how it was made. For me, art is about impact. It's lovely to know how it was made. I'm glad they didn't go and photograph somebody else's work. That's really important. But, and I'm glad it's original and, um, and that they've had these wonderful ideas of capturing brain waves and translating it into images. But for me, it's impact. And like you say, it's intake of breath. This piece is stunning in installation. It's a real museum piece. And Rafik Anadol, he doesn't have as many as people, but he has over a million followers on Instagram. Um, he's hugely, hugely big in this world and is um, much, much wanted in um, all over the world to show his work. Now, the, the video we saw there um, was of a person looking at a framed display. And I couldn't make up my mind whether the artwork was the framed display yeah, or whether right. it was the, so, it, or whether, so, but, and is, is it silly of me to, even to ask whether it no, might no, have no, been? No, that, no, that, that's not silly because there are pieces where you would have a dancer in the front. Many pieces would have mm. a dance going on or maybe some mud there, you know, or some mm. sort of, tree or something going on. Many pieces that win Lumen Prizes have lots going on in the foreground. And the artist puts in, you know, it has to be water of two inch deep to give the reflection onto, you know. And so that's not a stupid question at all. In this case, that's his wife. That's Mrs. Mrs. Anadol. I don't know her first name. And he, he okay. filmed her, her watching it. And in which case I'm gonna declare that short video a kind of variant work of art in its own right. Because for me, you know, a lot of the excitement was sort of imagining the interaction between the, uh, you know, the human silhouette and the, uh, and the, and the generated artwork. So, too, a twofer. Twofer. Now, now we get on to the most recent prize winner, um, 
again, which is, do, do we have the motion here? Because of my recollection is that- uh, I didn't, but this... I would ur urge your, um, our um, listeners mm -hmm. to go onto the website of the Lemon Prize. This does have, the image revolves, as Robert is mm -hmm. saying, it's also installed in our virtual exhibition, which we'll put the link on at the end of the talk. So you can go into a virtual online exhibition and walk around this piece. It's meant to be 3D, um, uh, it was created to be a 3D view, but what's exciting to me, there are many things that are exciting about it. Um, can you go in a little bit closer, Yuri, on the, on the image? Because um, from looking at it from this distance, you don't get what's happening here. Oh, that's the wrong image. <laughs> mm -hmm. Can you just make it a little bit more um, zoom in? That's a little better. Yeah, that's better. So basically, Nuestra Victoria, our victory is very 2020. Uh, that 2020 was the year of the pandemic. It was the year of George Floyd. It was the year that um, statues fell down around the world. And um, this is a piece, a 2020 piece of a protest in 2019 of feminists against um, uh, brutal uh, treatment of women in Mexico. And they defaced, the feminists defaced this uh, incredibly famous statue in the center of um, Mexico City, it would be like defacing um, Trafalgar Square um, statues, uh, Nelson or something like that in the UK. And the government reacted by boarding it up and erasing all this graffiti and the artist was smuggled in by the feminists and photographed all the graffiti and using photogra photogrammic techniques, which is a 3D rendering technique to preserve forever what the feminist protest had been about. So very moving, very evocative, particularly as Robert says, if you can get to see the virtual exhibition of this or on her website and our website where it goes around the statue, perfectly, perfectly rendered. Um, just stunning piece, very exciting. And very exciting to have a woman to have our first Global South winner. We have a Global South award. She entered through that award and she won. So. A totally exciting piece. I, I, I wonder if you could pair up with Banksy to projection map the graffiti back onto the original monument. Um, what a great I mean, idea. It, no, yeah. nobody, yeah. nobody could complain if it was just a light show, right? And you know, it's all idea. preserved there. That's such um, a good idea. Yeah. No, it it also makes me think, I don't know if it echoed at all for you, Kara Walker's work. Um, Fons Americanus in the Tate, yes. which yes. You know, just a very, very superficial uh, you know, similarity in that she'd also you know, created uh, you know, a new but very traditional looking monument uh, yeah, uh, in which to, in which to uh, you know, remember and mourn the slaves rather than celebrate the slave owners. And uh, it, it, it got a rather cool reception. I must say, I, for myself, I loved it. But, uh, you know, I was, I was thinking, I, I, because of you know, looking at your piece, I then went back and, and, and looked at Kara Walker's piece. And I was kind of amazed that, uh, you know, it didn't knock everybody out. It certainly knocked me out and so did this. Wow, what a ride. Huh? And you still got, so tell us about this year. There's no, I mean, we, well, we haven't got open. a winner yet, but. We're hmm. open. Um, the call for entries closes June the 4th. So any of you out there that create Art with technology, please enter lumenprize.com. Or if you know people who enter, we have a, if you're a student, we have a free to enter student prize. And if you're from a Nordic country or a global South country, you get two bites of the cherry. So you get to enter in your category and then you're eligible for a second award. Um, very excited to see what's out here. Um, we've changed the awards again, as I say, we have now immersive environments as opposed to XR. And um, very excited to see what 2021 brings. So you could, and I, I should have said, earlier, we're looking here just at the kind of uh, prize of prizes, right? The, the, but there's a, there's a range of categories. Range so of there's, right. It gives me a great introduction into how we support these artists. So if you're long listed, there's a 60 work long list and a 30 work short list and then nine winners every year. You automatically become, whether you want it or not, part of the Lumen family. And then Lumen Art Projects, which is our parent, represents these artists for commissions, events, festivals that we're asked to provide work for. So we 
basically exist to provide opportunities for our network, which you qualify for by becoming one of these either prize winners, long-listed or short-listed artists. So lots of opportunities, hopefully, that we are building and the opportunities are growing thanks to the next image. <laughs> Okay, well, um, just one, one quick question following on from that before we go, which is, can one buy prints or in some form versions of these works of art from Lumen or does one go to the artist? I mean, let's say I um, want uh, we the one hanging behind you. Uh, we did it in the first year um, and we had a, uh, we struck a print collection and we auctioned it off for charity for Peace Direct. Um, uh, which was then run by someone, a friend of both of ours. Um, and we raised a lot of money and we also did an online auction that year with Paddle and raised a lot of money in the next year. But after that, it just seemed too much work to become um, a gallery, if you will, as well as running a prize and trying to represent artists in um, uh, exhibitions. So we gave it up and never went back to it. Um, we would think about it now because of NFTs. And I'll talk more about that um, when we get to that topic. But at the moment, no, you'd have to go to the individual artist if you wanted to get a print of any of these works. Okay, so we're about to come to the final and kind of off off topic image, but I think every oh one other thing we're Carla and I are running perfectly to schedule as you would expect from the CEO of Lumen Art Project. So um, after this we're going to stay talking, but uh, we're going to kind of declare ourselves informal and uh, you know uh, please you know join us in conversation in particular you know, join Carla in conversation and let her tell you more directly about any of the pieces we're talking about here and other things that Lumen is doing. Um, but just to wrap up, anytime now you say digital art to anybody, uh, what dominates the, uh, the field is this particular work which was auctioned at Christie's last, last month and allegedly fetched a headline number of 69 million dollars or doge coins i don't know so carla what does the, what, what's this done for your world i mean was your phone ringing off the hook after this happened uh, well my world the digital art world wasn't that rocked because we're familiar with we've been talking with a group it's since last june about having our own collection so it just shows you how carefully people are looking at it. the museum of Com contemporary and digital art and that'll come out in two months so we've been looking at it for 10 months but with christie's Imprimatur, is that the right, with Christie's stamp of approval, you heard about it. You know, um, my friends heard about it. My phone ran off the hook from the people who said, you do what? You do what with what? What is that that you do? Those people, my brother, you know, they were on calling me nonstop. What is this? Are you now rich? Tell me about it. So what it's done is it's brought you to me, the browser to me. How wonderful is that? And it's brought the contemporary art world, ABC News. I just went online this afternoon to just check on the latest news. ABC News has a really good piece about this. Terrific piece, seven minute piece, April 22nd, click on it. It has the image of people being there when he gets the, who sees the auction in his home. He's a lovely guy, he's a sweet guy. I don't like the work at all, at all, but I'm happy for him, he's a digital artist and he's now a rich man. He had been selling work, Robert, for $100 before this. He went from $100 to 68 million. I mean, it's nuts. The guy who spent that money did not have, he bought those Deutsche coins or whatever they, Bitcoins in 2013 for nothing. So, you know, I mean, this is funny money, right? For him, it's, it's silly stuff for him. It's not going to happen again like that, I don't think, but it's been great to publicize. You now know what an NFT is. It's been great to publicize it. And if somebody, if you know uh, about it and is interested in buying, that's great for all digital artists. So it's turned my world upside down and by linking us to the contemporary art world, to the press, to the media, to the people who want to know. So when I do launch the Lumen Prize collection, I expect a really good response. Okay, so that's fabulous and bang on time and a wonderful chat. And I love 
Okay, I might, I love all of the pictures. Some of them I love better than others, and I, I especially love the one hanging behind you. Now, question, okay, from the room, Helen, Helen MacDonald is saying, is, you know, can you effectively stream these or some of these works so that people can have something closer to the, yes. uh, you know, the institutional experience at home? Yes, yes. And, and this is re I'm really glad you asked that question, Helen, because one of the things I wanted to talk about with Robert is the development of hybrid exhibitions. I mean, the FT was writing about it yesterday, bless them. So a hybrid exhibition means you can see something offline, online, um, so more and more institutions will be developing this, and we have developed it this year because we had to. So um, Fury has just put in the chat, uh, if you look in the chat, the 2020 Winners Virtual Exhibition we developed with Leonardo, click on that, you'll see all the current 2020 winners, all nine winners in real life. You can stream them, you can keep it on, there's lovely music, you can show it to your friends, you can have it on your iPad, it can be the background when you're doing something else. And this, ours is now a year old, well, eight months old, and it's old technology. This is changing so fast. So it's a very exciting, exciting world um, to be in at the moment. We're working with three other possible, there's something called Decentraland. Have you ever heard of Decentraland? Anyway, go check it out. Decentraland is full of art galleries, and it, again, it's online. Nothing is headsets or downloads. It's all through the internet. So quite easy to get onto. So yes, Helen, lots, lots of them. Whoops, where's my, my dog just interrupted. Let's have a look. Uh, okay, another question. Are you, are, you, are more, are traditional artists crossing over into digital art or is digital yes. art a kind of a vocation uh, all its own? Yeah. Yes, I mean, Damien Hurst, Tracy Adam, yeah, they see money, come on, of course they are. I, I mean, if you've got a name, you can parlay it into this world, that's gonna make a big difference. I mean, Beeple was chosen, he has a huge Instagram following. So the person who chose him from Christie's made a, made a calculated choice that this was somebody that his audience and 94% of the people that attended that auction were new to Christie's that's probably more exciting to them than their um than their what they made on the sale 94 percent new you know how exciting is that to bring new collectors into the art world so artists who want to find new collectors will be coming in of course they will um i also wanted to mention robert that my dear friend uh, david hockney the man who inspired me all those years ago is having another show this summer and i've already bought several lots of tickets to go see and I'm very excited, but it's being shown at, as the Royal Academy as iPad art, which they, they were a bit coy about it in 2012. This year, they're actually calling it iPad art, which is kind of interesting, you know? So it'll be printed, obviously, not shown on iPads, it'll be printed. But, you know, there's the Royal Academy, in a way, making sure everybody knows that this was made digitally. Great stuff. Well. Pulled out any more questions from the chat that we should be pulling in here? Okay, what about, um, yeah, going back to the, I think the first question I asked when we first talked about this, which is like the copying factor, the originality factor. Um, does that trouble artists? Does that trouble buyers still, or do you just? Well, well I, what I would put back to you is, did it trouble print purchasers who thought, well, how do I know this print isn't gonna be I mean, prints are no longer done on blocks that are destroyed. Prints are done on computers. How do you know when you buy a print that the artist isn't going to do a thousand more? What about photography? Um, if you buy an Ansel Adams or a, a Andreas Gretzky, um, you know, one of these wonderful artists that are shown at Haywood, you have to show, believe that they're not going to be printing dozens more photographs. It's the same thing. I, I'm a collector. I have video pieces in my home. And my, uh, the artist I purchased those videos from said, there are five videos, that's it. I'm not producing any more videos and I trust them. It's about belief in the artist. I buy it because I love the artist. I love the work and I believe in them. Um, I feel that trust is the same in digital as it is in print and photography. Mm. Do you think it's important for a digital artist to be an exciting person? And I often think that, you know, when people are buying paintings by 
Damien Hirst or you know, Caravaggio or whatever, that you know, the sense of some kind of organic contact with the artist is uh, you know, at least as important as the content of the work? That's such a good question. I'm thinking back to the artists I know who've been successful, like Rafik is hugely successful, Rafik Anadol. They are big personalities. Mar Mario Klingman is very active on Twitter and has a big following on Twitter. Um, and he's successful. I mean, I think probably the answer is you do have to be out there promoting your work um, in one way or another, being a big personality and being an exciting, as you put it, an exciting person. Because there's so many artists and art out there that, as you pointed out, beautiful work like Carol Walker's work, beautiful work that isn't getting its just desserts. And part of it is because the gallery needs your help to promote it, I suppose. Um, I'm not a gallerist, but I, I guess that's what they need. Well, I bet you've got an awful lot of gallerists hanging on your every word since <laughs> uh, you know, you've pretty much invented all of this from <laughs> oh, NT12 right. to people. Okay, well, look, we've done brilliant. It's been a fantastic conversation. I've loved every minute and I've learned a lot. So um, I think it's probably lunchtime in New York now and it's maybe sort of brunch time on the West Coast and it's probably supper time in Wales, isn't it? So, it's supper time, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Marie, anything, anything queuing still to say or shall we say good night from Riga and good day from Wales? Thank you, Robert. Thank you okay. for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay, uh, so good night. All the best. Thank you so much, Carla. Oh, I just was enjoyed it so much. Thank you. It's fantastic. Is, hi, Sarah. Lucas. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, people staying to say hello to you. Um, I was just going to say goodbye to Robert, but I guess he has to come back on, right? Oh, gosh. Uh, he will probably call you on your okay. phone.